Street Life Ministries is a Christ following nonprofit that serves homeless folks on the Mid Peninsula. We meet really interesting people. And today, we'd like to share one of those with you. All right, everybody, I'm here today with a friend of mine, Danny. Um, that I've known for a couple years and has an awesome testimony. So I can't wait to uh, dig into your story and share uh, what, what what's transformed your life. Thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. So um, share with me a little bit about your story. So before we met at Menlo Park, so oh. I, know, I know a little bit about who you are. Um, first off, I want to say thank you for, for what you've done. I know you fought for this country as a vet, and I'm honored to honored for that as a patriot myself and so um just thank you you're welcome so uh where were you born and raised i was well i was born in san diego in a military in the naval hospital and um then i was raised in santa cruz fresno and san jose okay the three cities I three cities lived in. okay and um mom dad mom dad divorced when i was six years old and um I kind of was on Greyhounds, going between cities, Fresno or Santa Cruz and San Jose, <clears throat> and uh, just, yeah, vis- doing my visits. Yeah, back then it was, you know, they didn't, co-parenting was something uh, that not too many people, I guess, knew about, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it, they, they were trying the best they could. Yeah, same here. I'm 50, and I remember when I was a kid, um, divorce was very rare. Now, yeah. now yeah. it's like you hear about it all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was very rare. I had one friend that uh, his parents split in grade school, and the way I, it was hard to when my mom explained it to me, I still didn't understand it. Yeah. So it was it was different. Um, brothers and sisters. Yeah, I have a, a, a brother who just passed away uh, about two years ago. Mm. Uh, th- he was thirty one, um, Ryan, and my sister Susie. She passed away a month before my brother did. Uh, died from cancer, and I have one um, sister, Gina. Uh, she lives in Felton. Um, she's uh, my half sister. I'm the only child with my mom and dad. Okay. Are you? Do you, is your mom and dad still around? Um, no, my mom passed away. And my dad is. Yeah. Dad yeah are, you, are you still close? Oh uh, yeah. Well, extremely. Uh, now that I'm clean and sober. Yeah. Building that relationship back up, and That's awesome. uh, you know how sometimes you've done things so for a while and they're just kind of waiting for that that foot to drop or that shoe to drop yeah so he's really standoffish but totally like calling every we talk once a week we text message back and forth all the time that's awesome yeah so um what was your childhood like besides the bus trips yeah so uh my childhood was uh it was mostly i would say um in san jose with my dad and then um, I had a stepmom, and um, that was hard. Um, living with my dad, his wife, and their brand new kids, and mm. I was like a nine-year-old boy that came into the um, to the mix. So it was it was difficult trying to fit in there at the house, and sure. so school wasn't even wasn't the, I wasn't very good at school. I I played some sports and. I did good all the way through junior high, but when high school came and the hormones and all that stuff, I took I moved out of my dad's house and then moved in with my mom in Santa Cruz. Uh, finished high school and joined the Navy right out of right out of high school. Oh, just right out of high school. Yeah. So were you using in high school? Um, pot yeah. and you know the just nothing nothing hard. Okay. Drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of normal. Yeah. Well, I don't want to say normal, but I, I guess I'm in recovery. For, for me. I'm in recovery, so that's yet yeah, normal. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anybody who's listening to this that that they don't find that normal, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I have a lot. Of, just so you know, there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that never been homeless, okay. and, and have never had any drug addiction, or alcoholism, and it's good for them to hear these podcasts, but because they get to a, a view of what it's like and what what kind of Brings us into these into the rooms, right? Yeah. So high school, Navy. So tell us that. What what, what was that all about? So um, it, when I joined the Navy, uh, this is this is a really big part 
of of the rest of my life of how it kind of set myself up for the for the next twenty year twenty five yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely. We'd love to hear it. Um, so I was uh, boot camp. I did great. I'm good at, good at being told what to do, and I I was really good at that. And then uh, I went to A school in Millington, Tennessee, mm-hmm. and I had um, my superior uh, right when I got there asked if I wanted to per- perform sexual activities with him. Mm. And here I am, young guy, 18 years old, you know what I mean? Um, and it, it uh, wouldn't stop. And uh, the day before graduation, I graduated I'm, uh, from ABF school. And um, I got beat up by three guys. And just like almost, I couldn't breathe. Black eye held down on the ground. Uh, if it wasn't for this first class petty officer that broke it up, I don't even know his name. I don't know. He broke it up, and uh, I graduated, and then they f- put me on an airplane and landed me on the USS Carl Vincent out at sea, mm. so on a mail jet. And then uh, from there, being in the military on a boat with 5,000 guys, with that experience just had happened. So I, I, I want to kind of rewind just a little bit and just let, or fast forward and let you know that um, the last year and a half that I've lived at the Haven House, I've gone through... <clears throat> hundreds of hours of therapy figuring out for the first time in my life like I know what happened before I was like I didn't know what happened and I'll explain that <clears throat> as <clears throat> as we go on in this this uh this testimony I can explain kind of what how it how I see it that it happened or my truth mm-hmm. and so um when I get on the ship um now I'm on the ship and I had uh not even three weeks in, I had some, um, I had some complications um, with my body, and I had an operation out at sea. And then I was put on convalescent leave, and I was on crutches. And um, that I think that whole going through therapy, that whole experience, looking at it now, back then, I started to get in trouble. I started to do things because I didn't want to be in the Navy and I didn't know how to tell anybody that, hey, this had happened to me. It was like a don't ask, don't tell policy. I'm a, I'm a man. I'm not telling another man that, a, that they wanted to do these things with me. And, um, you know, I guess the right thing would have, would have been to tell my command an officer above him to use my chain of command, right? But I didn't know. And so I did things to get... I didn't want to be in the, in the military anymore. And I come from a, my dad, my grandpa, my dad, Vietnam vet, my grandfather, a Korean vet, um, all Navy. And um, so I did things. I spent three, a little over three years, almost three and a half years uh, in the military, getting in trouble, doing time in military penitentiaries. The, they call them Briggs. I did Treasure Island and consolidated, consolidated Brig Miramar. Um, they walked me through the airport shackles around my waist and my hand around with a guard on each side. Wow. And um, I did it. I went to a special court martial. Um, when I got out, I just forgot about it. I was like, no, you know, I just went on with my, li- with my life and <clears throat> I met my... Um, my kid's mother, and uh, I have three daughters with her, and I lived in Santa Cruz. I went to work for my dad's construction company, and worked. Um, and uh, this is where the drugs really got increasingly like. Um, I started going to the doctor's office because I work construction, so I said my back hurts. Right. Yeah. And then I liked taking them. I'm like, oh, that feels good. No more pain. And I was so I'm a um, a product of that whole oxycotton. Yeah. Pushing, they were pushing oxycotton's, giving me so so much of that stuff, and um, then they took them away from me, and then I was sick, and I didn't know what to do, and so I started using heroin. And um, so I'm like 20, 20, my late 20s, 
early mid to late twenties, and I started um, smoking it and then shooting it, and then um, next thing you know, I'm just a an IV user, mm-hmm. and you know it comes along with that. I mean, just uh, the family just blew up. Right. The kids were put in foster care. They were taking CPS. Yeah. I put myself in situations to get to get drugs where I was stabbed, shot at. Uh, guns pointed to my head and uh, I'm still here I got um, one year four months and 22 days today awesome. I have to look on my on my app but I'm close I'm right there I'm getting, that's awesome bro yeah that's awesome you, your wife was she using as well she, not really she was like uh, I had to hide it from her all the time so and then and then she did towards the end trying to keep the family together. We got the kids back and um, CPS. It was, it was messy. It was sure. real messy. Homelessness, um, in and out. And then uh, my mom passed away and my grandparents, people are dying mm-hmm. and I'm just still in that cycle. Where did you spend your homelessness at? Um, in the, so I was homeless in the Tenderloin Mission and the Mission District in San Francisco. That's a rough homelessness. After the, I, yeah, I got out of the Walden House and um, I stayed homeless uh, over there. And then I've been homeless in Santa Cruz and San Jose. Okay. Those are the three Yeah, cities. San Francisco is pretty rough. I don't, know, I don't know much about San Jose. I was homeless in San Jose for a minute, but... Yeah, San Francisco. I I uh, did a lot of dope in San Francisco myself. So yeah, I don't. very easy place to to stay. Getting out of the, that situation was it was definitely a. I made a choice and then just got out of it. I don't know how I could. I mean, people get st- stuck there. Yeah, my wife did her addiction in San Francisco. Yeah, and uh, we both uh, agree that there's a uh, there's a demonic spiritual hold. In the city of San Francisco, and you see it. Oh yeah, I, I we go up there now to do uh, uh, ministry, you know, to, to pray for people, and and we you can feel the demonicness in San Francisco. It's it's heavy. It's the home of the Satanic Church. Whew, I didn't know. know so that. you can imagine all the witchcraft that's put down on on that city. Yeah. So yeah, I know it's it's it's, it's there's a stronghold there for sure. Yeah. So um. So then, okay, so. You go from homeless, San Jose, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, and then um, how long ago? So when? Did, how did I end up meeting you? So this is a, this is a uh, cool little story on how we got uh, how I got clean. Um, my daughter, so I have a ni- a ten year old. She's ten now, and um, she was with my cousin for the summer because we had lost our house at the end of two thousand eighteen. In San Jose, we had a three-bedroom house there. My partner had her boys, and I had my daughter. And they were going to school, and then we lost the house um, because I was using. And um, we ended up being on the street, and it was really hard um, getting an Airbnb or a motel room every single night, like cracking that nut. And hustling and trying to make that happen so that my kid, so we weren't sleeping in a car, mm-hmm. um, was real. And then so what happened was my ex was living in a clean and sober house in Scotts Valley, and they were allowed to have their kids there. So my kid went, I I let my kid go there, which was the best choice. It was the hardest thing, you know, for me to do, even though I was using. Um, and then. Um, she left her in a my so my ex started using again too, and she left her in a migrant farm working house. Who? And I caught wind of this, and my cousin went and picked her up, my I mean my niece. So then I'm at San Jose Deer Dawn, sh- shopping cart, everything I own. Um. And my niece said, "Danny, I have to, I have to go back home to my dad's. School starting. I have to bring you Audrey." It was, she was either going to bring her to me or to her mom. And I said, bring her to me. And I called. I remember somebody telling me, you can call 211 and ask for help. And here's where I, I go. They asked me. They asked me some questions. I called 211. I said, I'm at the Dirt on station um, with my 9-year-old daughter, and we have nowhere to go. 
they asked me some questions. Are you a veteran? I'm a veteran. So they hooked me up with the veterans crisis line. And um, three days later, it was like, I think it was a Friday, Monday morning, um, Haven House Life Moves mm -hmm. um, called me and said, come down, we have, a, we have a spot for you. And they had a two bedroom, one bath apartment with a kitchen. And we weren't used to staying inside. We were, you know, we were outside all the times. So Jennifer and I, we grabbed the bed from the bedroom and put it out on this little balcony and we slept outside. They were like, what are these people doing? You know what I mean? Like we were just, it was weird. So we had to adjust. And um, we've been there since middle of August, 2019. And um, did you eventually go back inside? Oh yeah. Okay. That I was just, a couple nights. I, I just wanted to make sure. It was the summertime. It was like August. Yeah. We were like, this is so hot in here. We wanted to be. And so it was just a couple nights we were yeah, doing that. Yeah, and yeah. they, I think they, somebody said, hey, Danny, like, you can't bring your beds out on the balcony and <laughs> take them back inside and try to go to bed in there. So we, we, yeah, we started adjusting and taking a shower every day. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, when you're on the streets, your hands turn black. Yeah. No matter how many times you wash them, they're cracked and they're, they're like brown, like right. of dirt and you can't get them clean. Yeah. And slowly the dirt started coming off. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like getting clean and started uh, taking good care of myself. And one thing led to another. I went to an AA meeting in um, Menlo Park, the 1210 uh, meeting, uh, Trinity Church, I think it's by the high school over there. And um, I got a sponsor. And uh, one day turned into another day. And um, I stayed clean. Mm -hmm. they, they, one little thing happened right when we got to the shelter. Uh, because I didn't have an address, and I got had gotten into some trouble while I was out there. And uh, the sheriffs, like seven or eight of them, came into the complex, and I had to go do a three-day Redwood City to Santa, Santa Clara to Elmwood and took care of, uh, and then got a court date. And then my daughter, they, they even t let my daughter go to my cousins in Watsonville. They called them. So CPS didn't get involved, none of that, because I was, we were clean and, um, and yeah, so that's, I got a sponsor, started working the steps and, um, I met you and got that. You helped me with a food card that la it was, lasted me for like a month and a half or two months. <laughs> it's great. And then, cool. yeah, now I'm going to school. Um, I'm, uh. Fighting, a, I'm, I'm a part of a class action lawsuit with pharma um, for that oxycotton, that pandemic that happened with that whole thing. And um, I'm, uh, I got a bad conduct discharge out of the military. And um, I'm uh, right now, Swords of Plowshares is, uh, they've uh, hired attorneys to work to represent me in a military DD-214 upgrade. And um, there's just so many moving parts now that are just positive. And um, so that, so if, if the lawyers for veteran affairs, if they're able to do what they need to do, will they get rid of that bad conduct? Oh yeah. It's, and uh, then you'll be honorably discharged? Yes, sir. And That'd that's, be awesome. And that's gonna, and you know, that's, that's how I told you about knowing my truth. That takes us back to, that, and that's what I wanted to talk about when I told you about that was when that happened to me, that shouldn't have, that shouldn't, anybody in the military, in a military uniform should not ask another person in a military uniform to perform sexual activities with them. And, and being a young man and not knowing how to deal with that put me through a 25 year stint of not knowing what to do and making bad choices and self-medicating. Sure. So, okay. So I want to ask a couple of questions around that if, I, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, so not to, I don't want to label like all military bad, of course, because that's not the road I go down. Of but, course not. I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and I know that this is obviously an incident that probably happens. Right. And I'm sure it still happens it, to this day. It does. Yeah. Um, if there's anybody in military, that listens to this or watches our YouTube video and stuff like that. Um, looking back at what happened to your situation and what it caused, what would you say? 
for someone that's going through it or just look or just listening to this and going, hmm, I would say that uh, the United States military is, uh, I'm very patriotic. Sure. I knew that when I graduated high school, I was going to join the military. My dad did and my grandfather did. And um, things happen to people that make them um, do things. And I didn't even know, so I didn't even know um, how to go about it, that, that my truth, I didn't even figure this out. I, you know what I said, David, for years? Mm. I said, I must have done something to make that guy ask sure. me those things. And then I got in trouble, right? I started getting in trouble. I got in trouble because I'm a drug addict or I'm a loser or I'm a, right. I can't follow through with anything. So going through therapy, like intensive PTSD uh, therapy, and um, I have, I have, uh, I've been um, diagnosed as uh, extreme PTSD and anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm learning how to live with it today. And uh, I have tools, especially with AA. I have so many, so many tools that I can use sure. to reel that back in. Yeah. So if I had to say one thing, if someone's listening to this, um, I'm I'm hoping if here's what I'm hoping is that if somebody's listening to this and 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 something happened to them, or or something anything uh, sexual assault or anything like that, I would say, use your chain of command. Mm -hmm. Tell somebody, yeah. it's not your fault. You know what I mean? Like, don't let that, don't let what happened in that brief amount of time define the rest of your life, right? It took me 20, some 25 years to know that, you know what? If that guy wouldn't have said that to me, I probably would have went off into the military and, and been successful and retire. Who knows what could have happened? Oh, with you? Yeah. Right, right. You know, like. Yeah, I think that's, that, that, and that's, thank you very much, because that's kind of what, that was what I was trying to get at. Like, I, I want people to know, like, if in any situation, whether it's military or if you're a child or a kid listening to this and, yeah. and, and it's a parent or, or a, an adult, um, is to just not be afraid. Don't listen to the lie, whether the lie is being told to you or the lie is in I'm your... I'm sure I understand. Whoops. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Siri. Um, or the lie is is um, in your head. Yeah. You're telling it to yourself. Because I, I had things done to me when I was a kid and um, I carried that so for, you know. for, for yeah. a very long time. and. And and I was very I was very self destructive, and um, and so I know like you know uh, looking back at it now after going through a, a rigorous twelve step program yeah that man if I had just said something who knows I mean I'm grateful today I mean I'm a pastor today and and I and I do a lot of amazing things with my past yeah to help people now but I think gosh where would I have been <laughs> if back then I think if I had just spoke up right you know sure yeah um, but yeah I so I totally agree. You know, don't ever be afraid. Um, gosh, man, your testimony is powerful. Um, I can't believe I'm right here, sitting right here talking to you. you yeah. Know, like. Well, and, and so so the one part that I, I wanted to, to also uh, kind of hit on a little bit as we kind of close up too is, is um, you know, because we go to the same church. You know, we're going to RGC together. You know, Rick's our pastor. Um, I get to, I'm getting to know you better in a, in a men's uh, DNA class, which has been awesome. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, what was really cool is that my wife had a rummage sale right here at this church and, uh, you came walking up to me and, and it was just amazing how that worked. That's right? God, like, yeah. God, yeah, totally. When you walked up to me and, and, uh, uh, I was like, wow, God is, God is really cool. You know, for me, sometimes I see, um, in this, in this job, if you want to call it as a pastor with homeless ministry, uh, I see a lot of fail. Yeah, you know, I see I, a lot of people just self destruct and just either die or just spit out of control. So every now and then, when guys like you come walking up to me and I get to see a, a, just a just a testimony right in my face, it's God putting His hand on my shoulder saying, "See, yeah, it's, wor it's working." You know, it's they're few and <laughs> far between, but when you see it it's and, nice. it's, and it hits you in the face, it's like, "Thank you, God." Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen a lot of death. I've seen a lot of. Uh, people not make it or hearing about this person or hearing about that person. 
and they talk about it in AA. It's like you have a seat there, and you know, um, I'm just blessed. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to uh, to be a dad to my daughter. Yeah. To uh, be a partner, to be a son to my dad. Yeah. And you know, with all my family and relatives that I still have left, I have uh, mending to do. I'm still working on my ninth steps, my sure. ninth step amends. Yeah. And I do 10, 11, and 12 every day. Yep. Um, but uh, just so grateful for the opportunity to do one day at a time. And my motto is just do the next right thing. Yeah. You know? You know, I remember um, when I first got sober, uh, my dad passed away about six years ago. And, you know, which, which we were able to make an amends before he passed away, which I'm grateful for. I'm, I'm still a little sad. And sometimes I get a little angry at God. Like, why did he have to go? so soon because I really wanted to, I, I thought I, I needed more time with him. Um, but I, I'll never forget when I first got sober, uh, you know, talking about your ninth step amends. My amends to my mom was, I had to call her every day just so she knew I didn't go back out. And then every day turned into once a week. And once a week turned into, you know, um, a couple times a week, but they were different conversations. I just, I knew when my mom finally broke that, like, okay, the cops aren't calling to tell me that my son's relapsed and he's dead. Yeah. And um and I and and I pray for you that those those moments happen where your dad and they eventually get to that place you know yeah and uh, just to add another something David is that uh, I just put a I, so I'm still working with a therapist mm -hmm. and I put in a call uh, last week to um, uh, the vet a vet center in um, in uh, Redwood City and I've I've uh, qualified to go. Even with my discharge rating right now, I've qualified to go into group counseling and therapy at the vet in an actual milit uh, a vet center. So they're calling me like in the next week or two, and I'm gonna um, get to go into like groups and actually help other men, or uh, be a part of a group and help other men that are coming in and not knowing what to do. Like, what's the next step? I'm still trying to figure out, like working with this swords to plowshares attorney. Uh, what my next step is because you know military hurry up and wait we're waiting for military records they they can't find my medical records they can't so it's a it's it's a process and uh, I'm just staying the course and just doing the next right thing that's what I'm gonna try to do just doing today that's awesome well you know it's it's your way of working a 12 step yeah you're gonna give back yeah I, know, I think it's awesome. so important that helps me so much to help to to be an ear for somebody who's trying to figure it out. If I know one thing that I could like lead him in a direction or somebody in a direction and tell him, Hey, you should, this is a suggestion that I was given and I'll give, I pass that on. That's, that's what I, uh, that makes me feel good inside. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting how many people come up to me that really don't know much about recovery and the 12 steps and stuff. And they say, Oh, you know, you're doing such a great job, Pastor Dave. Right. And they don't realize it, but, in, inside, I kind of chuckle and like, it's really kind of a selfish thing because if I don't give back, my my disease will come back and kill yeah, me. Yeah, it's weird how it works, right? <laughs> it is. It's, it's selfish program, they it call is, it. It is. Yeah. It's a very selfish program. I mean, I love to serve. Yeah. But I also love knowing that in my service, it helps me not implode. Yeah, it's it's a win win. It's a win win. It is. It is. Thank you so much, Danny. David, thanks for having me. I appreciate you and God bless you, man. Yep. God bless right. you. Thank you. All right. Bye.